All right, so yeah, thanks uh, for everyone for joining the presentation session on social protection. Uh, my name is Jesse Lastonen. Uh, I'll be working as the chair of this session. Uh, I'm a research associate at UNU Wider, working mainly on tax benefit microsimulation modeling in our uh, SouthMod project. Uh, I'd also like to welcome our presenters. Uh, we have uh, Omolola Adeola from the University of Cape Town in South Africa, uh, Valentina Martinez Pabon from the Tulane University in the US. Uh, we have Yara Gomez from the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil, uh, Amakametu from the Namdi Atsikibe University in Nigeria, and finally Christoph Trupat from the German Development Institute. Uh, the five presentations are based on very interesting papers covering research on the impact of COVID-19 and related social protection measures on poverty and inequality uh, in both uh, South America and also Africa. Um, so in terms of practicalities, we will have these five presentations back to back and we'll open, the, open it up for questions and answers at the end of the session. Uh, presentations will be around six, seven minutes each. And uh, as I already mentioned to the presenters, please try to keep with the time and have your presentations kind of ready to go that, so that we have around 15 minutes uh, at the end for questions from the audience, uh, uh, which can be asked in the chat or in person if you let me know in the chat that uh, you'd like to ask a question. Uh, and I think uh, we'll start with Omolola, who actually has a pre-recorded presentation, but it is also here in person if the audience wants to ask questions. So I would ask Anna from Wider Communications to share that uh, pre-recorded session and we'll start with that. So thanks. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our presentation on COVID-19 social relief of distress grants in South Africa. I am Omarola Adeola, and this is a joint work with Rejoice Mabena. We're both postdoctoral research fellows with the Southern Africa Labor and Development Research Unit, SAUDRU, and African Center of Excellence for Inequality Research, ASIA, at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. At the start of the pandemic, we saw various countries implement lockdown measures to curb the spread of the virus. South Africa was one of the countries that implemented the most stringent measures around the world. And some of these measures worsened already existing imbalances, such as inequality in various dimensions. What we know is that some of these sustainable development goals, such as ending poverty and hunger, might have been compromised. And some of the measures implemented by South African governments to help citizens cope with the economic effects of the pandemic was to increase the value of existing grants and introduce a temporary social relief of distress grant of 350 rand. Therefore, the objective of our study is to determine if the SRD grants significantly improved the living conditions of households as there was a large take up of the grants between May and September 2020 we are 9.15 million applications received the SRD grants. Social grants in South Africa is a comprehensive social protection measure, which has reached over 18 million grants paid monthly as at March, 2021. The data for our study is the needs cram data set. Needs cram is a national income dynamic study, coronavirus rapid mobile survey, and this is a data set drawn from the needs with five sample. The needs is a nationally representative panel study of over 28,000 South Africans followed every two to three years, which started in 2008. The needs crown was carried out telephonically, which started in the early days of the lockdown in 2020 to track people's income and employment status over the period of the pandemic. To date, there are five waves of the needs crime available, but we make use of the first four waves in our study. We estimate a conditional fixed effects logistic regression where households experiencing hunger take the value of one and zero otherwise. In this first figure, we'll see that household and child hunger were highest in the first wave with at least 22% and 15% respectively. But by the second wave, with the introduction of the SRD grants, 
and top up to existing grants, we notice a reduction in household and child hunger. And the second figure here, we see that households that lost their main source of income during the lockdown experienced more hunger than households that did not lose their main source of income in all the waves. Hunger experiences, however, reduced drastically in, in the second wave, which coincided with the introduction of the SRD grants. As we see, it fell from 31.67% in the first wave to 22% in the second wave. In this third figure, we see that households with at least one employed member had less chance of experiencing hunger compared to households with all members unemployed or not economically active. The results of our conditional fixed effects logistic regression shows that the recipients of social grants lowers the probability of experiencing hunger. Whereas the SRD grants did not have the same effect. We also noticed that in our study that the existence of significant association between hunger outcomes and labor market status Households with economically inactive individuals have a higher chance of experiencing hunger relative to households with employed members. Unemployment increases the odds of experiencing hunger. We see that people living in urban areas are the higher chance of experiencing hunger and non-monetary support from the government, NGO and community were significant in reducing hunger experiences for households. We also notice that for school, for children in school feeding schemes, there was less chance or likelihood of experiencing hunger, which is highly significant in our study. Therefore, we see that the SRD grants lessened the chances of child hunger, suggesting that the SRD grants had a positive impact on children's access to food more than it did for adults, as you can see in this um, fourth and fifth column. So in conclusion, in our study, we see that social grants reduce hunger for households. However, the impact of the SRD grants was less obvious. This we see is probably due to the minimal value of the grants. During the lockdown, non-monetary support mechanisms, such as the community support receipt of food parcels and NGO support, helped households to be more food secure. South Africa's high unemployment rate needs a more sustainable solution beyond the current social protection. And therefore, we recommend that the introduction of a basic income grant with value over the upper bound poverty line in South Africa. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, I then uh, give it again to Anna, who will share Valentina's presentation, which is also pre recorded. Good morning, my name is Valentina Martinez and I'm here to present my paper, The Impact of COVID-19 and Expanded Social Assistance on Inequality and Poverty in Argentina, Brazil, Colombia and Mexico. This is joint work with Nora Lustig, Federico Sanz and Stephen Chunger. Uh, this paper addressed three, three main research questions. Uh, the first one is what is the potential impact of COVID-19 on inequality and poverty in, in 2020? The second is who are the biggest losers across the pre-crisis income distribution? And the third one is to what extent does the expanded social assistance mitigate the negative impacts? We address, uh, we obtain our estimates by simulating potential income losses at the household level using a micro data from household surveys. And the first step of our micro simulation is to identify at risk and not at risk income. 
So we defined a not at risk income as the income coming from cash transfers, pensions, public employment, remittances, labor income from essential sectors, and labor income from white collar workers with internet access at home. Uh, we define at, at risk income, uh, the income coming from a in non essential sectors, labor income from street vending, and household income from rents. Once we identify the components of the of the household income, one of the uh, one of those is uh, the income in the the income at risk. We simulate potential losses using two key parameters. The first one is the share of households with at risk income that lose income, and the second is the share of at risk income loss for those losing income. In this matrix, we, which is an example, is the, the, the one for Argentina, we have in the rows uh, the percentage, uh, the share of households losing income, and on the columns, the share of, of income loss, so each parameter here. Um, so each cell in this matrix represents a different scenario. Um, the number in each cell is the total income uh, that, that will contract uh, based in that specific uh, scenario. So we focus on, on out of the 100 scenario, the possible scenarios, we focus only on those for which the contraction comes closest to that uh, uh, predicted by the IMF for, for each country in 2020. And of those uh, scenarios, the, in this case, the one that are highlighted there, we focus only on the scenario for which the share of households that lose income, that's the row, goes closest to, to, this, to that suggested by the high frequency service. The third step in our, in our uh, simulation is to construct an income distribution that incorporates the losses and compare it with the exempted income, distrib uh, income distribution. And the first step, uh, the fourth step is to simulate an income distribution that incorporates the effect of the pandemic, but also the new compensatory social assistance measures. Uh, let me go directly to the results. Um, here we have the impact on inequality may, uh, measured by the Gini coefficient. And for each country, we have the ex-ante, the ex -post, and the ex -post plus social assistance distributions. And the first thing to the first thing to highlight here is that the potential impact of inequality can, uh, could be quite significant, but also that the social assistance significantly offsets the effect on inequality. So as you can see here, uh, based on the inequality, but also here in poverty, measured by the 5.5 PPP poverty line. Uh, in Brazil, for example, uh, uh, we have uh, that the poverty is even lower than, than in the pre-exante situation. We have here exante, exposed without, and exposed with expanded social assistance. So on uh, our results suggest that the government that have introduced new and substantial expansions on the existing social assistance may offset a significantly share of the poverty cost, poverty and inequality caused by the crisis. So finally, let me present the non-anonymous growth incidence curves. This, uh, these figures presents the change in income at each percentile of the exempted income distribution. So the bold line, uh, suggest that all on average, all households uh, in, are worse off than in, in the situation before the crisis. Um, the dash line suggests that once you account for the for the expanded social assistance, new and expanded social assistance, on a, on average, the households are are in a better situation. In particular, the households, uh, the the poorer households. Uh, and this negative slope in the bottom indicates that mitigation has been proposed, but also that the poorer households uh, end up with, a, with, a in, with an income that is even uh, larger than in the pre-crisis income this, uh, in the pre-crisis. Um, this that is all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, we will have Yara Gomez who will actually present uh, in person or, well, virtually in person. So uh, you can start, Yara. So good morning. Sorry for the technical issues. Um, 
so the, this paper is made with Carlos. And the name of the paper is Liquidity Constraints, Cash Transfers, and the Demand for Healthcare in the COVID-19 Pandemic. So cash transfers during the pandemic have been justified on the basis of allow adherence to lockdown measures and also mitigate effects on the labor market and aggregate demand. But we think that cash transfers may, might have a third effect. That is, cash transfers might directly affect uh, demand for medical care. So why this might happening? So people might be suffering from liquidity constraints. So the cost of opportunity of their daily earnings may be too high. So we predicted that with these cash transfers, we will have uh, diminished the lag between symptoms and medical care, but we will also increase hospitalizations just after people receive cash transfers, because now they will be able to seek medical care. So Brazil implemented an emergency cash transfer program from April to December of last year. It was an unconditional cash transfer. It was a very large program and it was relatively generous. To, for, for you to all have an idea, it was bigger than our currently biggest social program that was also familiar. So the government implemented a calendar that, the, that was made for at the banks. So it was the money was available by the month of the birth. So people who was born in January and February received the money earlier, and people who was born in November and December received the money for for the last. So we have this data for the municipalities and for each cohort, and we have a daily data. So with this data, we was able, we were able to use that opportunity in time. And the intuition behind this, this method is for each cohort to compare hospitalizations and the leg to medical care just before and just after the, the transfer is made. So we, we are interested in the effects just after the cash transfer. Uh, and the data was from the Minister of Health. So, Okay, so we have a large drop in the days to hospital. Can we? I, I don't know if if we can, I think. Oh, I think it's, I have some problem here. Okay, so our results are that just after the cash transfer, uh, a drop in the lag between people have the first symptom and seeking medical care. We we measure this lag between they they have they reported the symptom and uh, here. Okay, so I think it's back. Um, so we measure this the first symptoms and when they get their COVID test. So after the after they receive the this cash transfer, we have a, so people get to get the COVID test much earlier than it was getting before before the cash transfer. And the effect the effect of this was about 13% in the in the diminishing of this light. And we also have increasing hospitalization. So just after the the cash transfer was made, we have an increase increase in hospitalizations. So our our explanation for this was so severe the liquidity constraint they and they couldn't uh, couldn't go to the hospital and now we've received this cash transfer they were able to demand medical care they couldn't they couldn't demand earlier so i think this is the result i'm having trouble but it's it, it i'm done thank you Thanks so much. Very interesting work. Uh, then we have two more presentations. Uh, the next we will have Amaka Metu from the Nambi Azikiva University in Nigeria. Amaka, you, you want to share your screen? And just to say, you have 
minutes. We don't have much time. We need okay, to have sorry for that. Uh, no worries okay. at all. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, the topic is uh, post COVID 19 pandemic, those foreign aid matter in achieving inclusive growth in sub Saharan Africa. Um, the way the effect of uh, COVID 19 in Africa may not be that much in terms of health status, in terms of death effect, but it has caused them. Um, Disruptions to major flows of in terms of trade, foreign direct investment, and uh, remittances. And for the fact that this uh, flow of income has been affected, there is the possibility that sub Saharan African countries will find it very difficult to finance their economic activities in terms of reduction in poverty, inequality, and unemployment. And we know that Sub-Saharan Africa is characterized already by these uh, ills of poverty, inequality, and unemployment, showing that Sub-Saharan African country economic growth is not inclusive. It does not encourage economic opportunities in terms of job employment and others. And despite these COVID-19 activities, the foreign aid flows into African countries from donor countries in 2020 alone is about 161.2 billion US dollars. And bilateral aid to Africa and least developed countries rose by almost 1.1 and 1.8 respectively. And hence we assume that sub-Saharan African countries can leverage on these foreign aid in order to improve their economic activities in pandemic. And our objective is to examine how sub-South African countries can leverage this foreign aid in proving inclusive growth post COVID-19 pandemic. And to examine the role of institutional environment. We are looking at the role of institutional environment because we found that despite aid flows to African countries, that they still find it difficult to achieve, to reduce poverty and unemployment. And studies by Guara has said that the environmental effect the environment and institutions are the causes of Africa not achieving inclusive growth using their foreign aid. And we, in terms of methodology, we use 48 South African countries using data from 2000 to 2019. And we looked at foreign aid of inclusive growth and we use inequality adjusted growth instead of the GDP, which others have been using. And we also looked at other um, variables which literature has found to affect growth. And our finding shows that institutional quality has a significant, though minimal, impact on the level of inclusive growth in African countries. And then foreign aid, when we interacted foreign aid to institution, it shows that foreign aid could actually improve um, inclusive growth. Based on these findings, our study suggests is uh, recommending for Africa to leverage on foreign growth, in, to leverage on uh, this foreign aid coming into the country, that there is need to strengthen commitment to development by improving government effective, effectiveness. Also, the donor countries can channel this um, aid to agriculture and education because of their link to human capital development. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amaka, and thanks for being quick. Uh, I was right. really impressed with that uh, speed. So finally, we have Christoph Trupat from the German Development Institute. Christoph, uh, feel free to share your, uh, your screen. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, present. Um, this is joint work with uh, Zemzem, Arjun, and Matthias. Um, they are all at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And um, the topic is, uh, it's not fully related to social protection. We are focusing mostly on the uh, COVID-19 vaccines in uh, low-income countries in particular from, um, uh, um, from uh, we, are, we are focusing on Ethiopia. Um, what is important to understand, of course, we all know in order to successfully control the pandemic, uh, we really have to rely on the COVID-19, on the available COVID-19 um, 
vaccines. But what we can see and what we know also from the news and so on is that many low income countries in particular from Sub-Saharan Africa are lagging behind in their vaccination campaigns, which is mostly, of course, due to the limited vaccine supply. No? And um, it is important, of course, given these kind of limited vaccine supply to plan the hope for the upcoming uh, vaccine campaigns in low income countries very well uh, in order to use these scarce resources most effectively. And therefore the vaccine acceptance and also maybe the willingness to pay for COVID-19 vaccines are important demands and factors in our, um, in our view that needs to be considered. And when you look at the literature, you see that there are many studies. So the, the field of the literature is growing very fast. Many studies are focusing on the willingness to take COVID-19 vaccines in particular focus on high and middle income countries. Um, but we are also seeing now many studies coming from low income countries, for example, uh, also from uh, many countries from Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, so the evidence base is growing. Uh, only few studies have explored the willingness to pay for COVID-19 vaccines in low income countries. And um, uh, what is also important to know that many of these studies are yeah, using phone or online surveys, which um, you know have some kind of limitations. Well, what we have done, we have done an in-person survey of 2,332 uh, randomly selected households in Ethiopia in October and November 2020, right before the uh, conflict also started in Ethiopia. So we managed to do a national representative survey, uh, which is only representative for the informal sector. And it, it was uh, a joint project with the ILO and the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. And we, the overall aim of the project was really to understand the the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the informal sector. But here in this presentation, we'll focus on the vaccines. And yeah, first, of course, we would like to know what is the willingness to take and pay for COVID-19 vaccines in Ethiopia. And then, of course, second is like to, to understand the social demographic color rates uh, of the willingness to take and pay for COVID-19 vaccines. Um, yeah, in order to dive, in, uh, to dive into the results, so the um, descriptive results, so we see that there's a high willingness to take COVID-19 vaccines in Ethiopia. So Christoph, at least, uh, to, yeah. uh, we only see the first slide. Have you been switching slides in between? Because uh, Okay, can you see it now? Yes, yes. And can you go okay. to full screen mode as well? Yeah, maybe this is troubling. The, it's a cause of trouble. But can you see now the slide switch? Yes, yes. Okay, I will leave it like this because the full screen mode, I think it's... Uh, okay. Um, brings the trouble, but um, okay. Um, you can see here now the willingness to take COVID-19 vaccine when it's available at the local market. Um, so we have put these two questions. So here's again the slide with the research objectives, which you could, could not see probably, but um, here we have the descriptive results. So we see that um, almost 90% of our respondents, so as I said, representative for the informal sector in Ethiopia are willing to, to take COVID-19 vaccines. And um, uh, conditional on those that are willing to take the COVID-19 vaccines, we, we see that 33% um, uh, of them are also willing to pay uh, for the COVID-19 vaccine. So we see this kind of gap um, between, of course, willingness to take the COVID-19 vaccine and willingness to, to pay for it, uh, which is interesting. And um, in order to do a kind of analysis. Our second research objective was to, to understand what are the socio-demographic uh, correlates. So we have uh, run a logistic regression model, very simple, including different uh, predictors like age, gender, education, and so on, but also um, health insurance coverage, for example. Um, you know, in Ethiopia, we have a successful community-based health insurance scheme and so on. And here, the main results. So you can see what determines the willingness to take the COVID-19 vaccine. So these are just correlates, but um, you can see that those families or those respondents that have experience with COVID-19 had an, had an infection, of course, are uh, more willing to take the COVID-19 vaccine. So we see a very strong a positive correlation here. And what is also interesting, we have included question on trust in government and institutions, which is also seems to be a kind of, seems to be strongly correlated or associated with the willingness to take the COVID-19 vaccine. So the higher the trust in the government institutions, the higher the willingness to take the COVID-19 vaccine. It seems to be a bit like this. Um, we see no, nothing on education here, nothing on income. We see a bit something on age, that some of the age groups are less likely or 
this seems to be a negatively correlated with the willingness to take COVID-19 vaccines. And then the second one is like what determines the willingness to pay for COVID-19 vaccines. So as I said, this is conditional on those that are willing to take uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. And here, what we see here is a kind of income gradient. So those that are more wealthy are also more willing to pay for the COVID-19 vaccines. So 60% of those that are in the highest income groups are also willing to pay for COVID-19 vaccines. What is also interesting, when you are covered by health insurance, those are also uh, more willing to pay for it, like 40% of them. And um, you also see something a bit on trust and so on. So um, interesting correlations. Um, just to sum it up, what we find, what is very interesting is that there's in general a high willingness to take the vaccines in Ethiopia, um, which would be would also um, uh, lead to the uh, achievement of herd, herd immunity. Potential reasons are we had very successful health insurance campaigns in the past and so on, substantial, uh, substantial investments in health infrastructure. But of course, as I said, we have done the survey before the conflict. And uh, now this is maybe the main challenge uh, given the conflict, how probably the vaccine, um, the willingness to take the vaccine has decreased in Ethiopia, which is very serious. We see this kind of large gap between willingness to take and willingness to pay. And, um, but we see that uh, many of our respondents are in the lowest income categories where their ma a majority is not willing to pay. And this is really a strong call uh, for free or subsidized COVID-19 vaccination programs and campaigns. It's very important in Ethiopia. And um, yeah, I will conclude by this statement. And um, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that, this work. Thanks a lot, Christoph. So we're, we were almost in time, so I'm, I'm really happy with this. We have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, if anyone from the audience wants to ask a questions, uh, you, you can write that in the chat. Uh, and while waiting, I have a few questions of my own. So maybe just uh, to follow up on Christoph's presentation, you showed that uh, two thirds of those who wanted the vaccine uh, would not like to have paid for one uh, in the first place. And actually, as you also mentioned, those those that would like to pay for a vaccine were mostly in the top uh, top of the income distribution. So kind of a practical question, uh, how expensive are vaccines in Ethiopia and do people actually have to pay for them if they want one in certain regions, for instance? Uh, should I answer directly or? Yes, you, you can answer. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, currently the vaccines are, um, as I understood, are for 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 free. So um, the vaccine cam campaigns are very um, also also in Ethiopia is very is very limited. Um, I don't know the you know the exact um, share of uh, the population that is covered by the vaccines, but it's uh, not um, um, so it's uh, very low as compared to high high and middle income countries, unfortunately. And um, yeah, the prices are also changing. It's also difficult to, to say. No? So for example, the mRNA uh, vaccines are more expensive than the uh, vector-based vaccines and so on. And it, and, and it depends. No? So, um, but yeah, in general, um, we think it's very important to mention that um, many are not willing to pay for it or maybe cannot pay for it. And therefore, um, yeah, the government of Ethiopia has to care about it, but also the external donors uh, that these uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, doses and so on should be for free and so on in order to um, achieve um, a high share of people that can um, get the vaccine. No? Mm -hmm. Thanks, that uh, makes it clearer. Um, then I'd maybe ask uh, Yara about your findings. Uh, so you basically find that cash transfer may increase demand for medical care. And something I, I kept wanting to know more about is What's the mechanism behind this? Why do people actually, uh, why are people more likely to seek uh, medical care after such a grant or after they receive some support? So what what you think is what we think is happening? It's because people. Okay, so some context for Brazil, uh, healthcare here is free, so people don't need to pay for healthcare. So people who use the so the public health system here are very poor families. So the data we have, is, so what I think is happening is that people can't stop working. So now that they 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 receive this cash transfer, they can stop stop working to go to the doctor. So they, they 
opportunity for losing a day of work, a day of job, is too high for them because, because they are very poor. So now that they have this cash transfer for the government, now they can, okay, I'm sick, now I can seek medical, medical. We think mm -hmm. that that's the mechanism. Right, yeah, thanks. That uh, makes it easier to, to understand. Then we have one question from the audience. That's also for Christoph. Um, basically, uh, Raj Katula is asking about, is the unwillingness to take and pay for vaccine, does that has, have any relation to social stigma, do you think? Um, yeah, this is a very good question. Um, I think um, this could be the this could be the case. So what we see is that most of the people in our survey are willing to to take a COVID nineteen vaccine. It's just like ten percent, no? So said that they are not willing, and um, it could be that these ten percent this is due to stigma. It also could be that um, these numbers that we have in our survey they are from October November. So it might be that the willingness to take the COVID-19 vaccine has decreased over time due to the conflict, but also due to the rumors of safety of some of the uh, COVID-19 vaccines. So it might be that um, this kind of stigma issue has come up um, um, until now and um, it, it explains um, uh, some of the um, reasons why uh, or, or explains why some of the respondents or some of the people don't want to uh, take the COVID-19 vaccine. Yeah, but it's a good, it's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, then maybe I'll ask one question from Omolola. Um, so basically, I was interested, you mentioned that the SRD grant didn't really reduce hunger, at least effectively. I'm simply wondering what's the main explanation behind this? Is it simply the small value of the grants? And, and how could that may be made better by, for instance, a basic uh, income transfer that you recommend? Okay, thank you very much for the question. So um, for the SRD grants, what we saw was that they didn't have much impact in reducing hunger. And um, where we think probably because of the low value of the um, amount, but at the same time, the people that received these SRD grants are people that are, um, the requirements for the receipt of the SRD grants are people that are unemployed. So um, those uh, people were already worse off, you know, at the lower end of the um, income distribution. And so they, they, have, they had higher chances of experiencing hunger, you know, compared to the um, the other people in the population. And so we see that um, the SRD grants, um, the value was quite low at 350. Mm -hmm. So we saw that it did not make much impact. But for the other grants, we saw that um, people could receive multiple grants, you know, when it came to that, like the child support grant and um, the old age pension. So in households where you have multiple grants, other grants you, you could have um, the hunger experiences being reduced compared to households with just SRD grants. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, then I actually noticed that there are questions from the audience in the Q&A box. So let's take the, take the questions from Kwabina from UNU Wider. Uh, he asks, for instance, uh, as safety nets are usually targeted on the poorest of the poor, did you examine uh, effects by quintiles or by parts of the income distribution. Okay, I think so yes. Sorry, it was oh. for Valentina. Yeah, that one's for me. Yes, we indeed analyzed uh, the effect of the of the chalk and also the expanded by centiles of the distribution. So that's why we uh, find out uh, our estimates suggest that in average all all households across the income distribution are are affected mostly those in the middle of the of the distribution and that the expanded social assistance was like indeed targeted to the bottom of the distribution and those are the households that were benefit that benefited the most from the expanded social assistance thanks um and then uh, let's go for the question from uh, Nandiki Nayak 
for Omolola. So she asks, uh, can Omolola tell us more about the profile of the beneficiaries, both SRD and non-SRD, and also what's the proportion of population that's getting these transfers? Okay, so um, for the SRD grants, as I explained earlier, most of the, um, for you to be qualified, the requirement is to be unemployed. Mm -hmm you know, during the period. So the government wanted to support those that were unemployed and those that lost employment during the ad lockdown, which started in March, 2020. So um, you see that households that applied for this um, sort of grant had uh, members, most of their members unemployed and they were mostly um, people at the lower end of the um, income distribution you know and so the compared to the to the other grants we saw the non srd grants we observed that um women were more represented you know in the srd in the non srd grants than the srd grants and um the srd grants targeted uh, those that lost employment which um, most of them were women, but because they were in, they were already getting some other grants, they could not qualify for these SRD grants, which reduced um, the population of um, the gender. They which uh, there was imbalance in the gender receipt of the SRD grants compared to the other grants we had. And then we saw that most of the people that received these SRD grants as well were young adults. You know, uh, most of them between the age of 20 and 24, which is, has the highest unemployment rate in South Africa. As well, we saw um, people in urban areas, areas like um, the KwaZulu Natal and Alten, having. Um, receiving uh, more of these grants than the other provinces in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so, thanks, Molola. I think I need to uh, stop you right here because we are actually, it's 11 o'clock finish time exactly now. So I want to thank everybody for the nice presentations. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, learning about these different topics and uh, great to see all of you here. Um, I guess Good luck with the rest of the conference and I hope you enjoy the rest of the session you decide to go see. And uh, if, if there are any questions or you want to talk more via email, let me know. And uh, I guess that's it. So thanks a lot. Thank you.